Hello everyone, today I am going to be presenting my paper, Rassel, written at the stack based side channel leakage. My name is Anirban Chakraborty and I am a PhD student at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. This work has been done in collaboration with Dr. Sharani Bhattacharya from KU Leuven, Mana Alam from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, Dr. Shikhar Patranabish from ETH Zurich and Dr. Devdi Mukhopadhyay from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Before going into the details of our work, I would like to talk about the deadline scheduler and try to understand its security implications. Schedulers, as we know, handles removal of processes from and selection of processes to the CPU. There are many types of scheduler, the common types being CFQ, NOOP, and the deadline scheduler. So, in particular, we focus on deadline scheduler here, yeah, which actually automatically preempts a process from the CPU after its request expiration time. It, it has found quite a wide applicability. Uh, mainly on uh, real-time operating system, embedded systems, and also in general purpose servers. However, the security implication of deadline schedulers have never been studied before. So in this paper, we'll talk about the uh, deadline scheduler and try to exploit its security implications. To enable the deadline scheduler, the user must have cap sys nice permission in order to adjust the scheduling parameters. Normal users can efficiently utilize system resources for better performance using deadline scheduler, which is common in case of real-time execution environments. To adjust the scheduling parameters, we can use the CHRT command along with the three parameters, shared runtime, shared deadline, and shared period, and the name of the executable. So in this presentation, we'll show how utilizing the deadline scheduler, an attacker can effectively achieve synchronization with the victim process. So here is the outline for our talk. First, we'll discuss about the return address stack or RAS. Then we'll see how to reverse engineer the RAS for undocumented processors. We propose a novel attack, RASL, by establishing a covert channel through RAS. Then we move on to the case study on OpenSSL ECC scalar multiplication. And we'll see how to use deadline scheduler to achieve synchronization. Finally, we see a case study on ECDSA signature generation algorithm. Return instructions are a special type of indirect branch instructions that might get called from different program locations, but the target address will remain the same. Now, for example, uh, take, take the example of the printf statement, which is uh, common for GNUC library, that can be called from different uh, locations in the, inside a uh, source code. So every time the same library subroutine will be invoked and the same set of instructions will be executed. But since they are being called from different program locations, the return address for each of the corresponding function call will be different. Now to reverse engineer the size of the stack, we devise a simple experiment. We start with an arbitrary number of nested function calls, suppose 17, where the main function calls function f17, which in turn calls uh, function f16, and so on, till the deepest function, which is f1 here. Now as per the working principle of RAS, the return address of the main function will be pushed onto the RAS first, followed by the return address of the function f17. Now suppose the RAS has a size of 16. So proceeding this way, when the function f2 is called, its return address will also be put at the top of the stack. And at this point, the stack will be completely full of all valid entries. Now when the function f1 is called, its return address will also be pushed into the stack. But as the stack was full at this point, it will lead to a overflow condition and thus the return address for function f17 will be pushed out of the stack. So one must note that RAS helps to keep the return address closer to the processor and thus reduces the access latency. So for any return address that is not present in the RAS, the processor will take more time to complete the execution. So we will use this increase in execution time to reverse engineer the stack size. So as already discussed, uh, we start with uh, n nested function calls and check the difference in execution time for n minus uh, for n calls and n minus 1 calls separately in order to account for the system noise we perform this operation multiple times and calculate the mean difference for their execution times then we repeat it for function depth n minus 1 and check the mean difference for n minus 1th and n minus 2th function calls so we reduce the function depth by 1 every time and keep a log of the difference in their execution time this plot shows the difference of execution time for consecutive function call depths. So we can observe that the difference in execution time between two consecutive function depths increases significantly after 16 function calls. So the reason behind that is when 
depth of next step function calls is less than 16, the processor gets all return addresses for the RAS and therefore takes considerably less time to complete the execution. So we can conclude that on our target system that we did this experiment on, the RAS can hold up to 16 entries. Now th this is a generalized experiment and can be generalized to any processor to find out the depth of the RAS for that system. We further validate our observation using hardware performance counters. We know that in a speculative execution environment, the target address for a return instruction is predicted by referring to RAS and matched with the actual value stored in the main memory much later in the pipeline. Therefore, any wrongly predicted address or an underflow overflow condition in the RAS will result in a branch miss event. Branch miss events are pretty accurately, can be pretty accurately measured using uh, uh, perf event tool and the event perf count HW branch misses. So we observe that for inner 16 functions, the number of branch misses is 2, whereas for the 17th function, the number of branch misses becomes 3 and it increments by 1 for every increment in the depth of the function call. So this validates that the size of the RAS is 16 and because after that when we are increasing the depth of the function, those are actually getting overflowed and as a result our, the, our branch misses gets incremented. So we exploit the fact that an overflowing RAS can result in an increase in execution time and this difference in timing can be observed by a co-located process to establish a covert channel between two processes. Now consider the scenario where two processes A and B are running simultaneously on the same logical code. Now process A executes a series of n nested function calls where process, uh, function f1 is calling f2 uh, which in turn calling f3 and so on. So therefore for each function call an entry is inserted in the top of the stack. Now we all choose n such that the entire stack gets filled with the return address. Inside the innermost function for A it yields the CPU before executing the return instruction. So therefore, the entire RAS is filled with the return address of process A and at this point, it is yielding the uh, uh, control of the CPU to another process B. Now B executes M functions also in a nested fashion. Now as both process A and B share the same RAS, the return address of process B will push out, uh, uh, will push out some of the return addresses of A or more specifically, n minus m number of return addresses for process A will be pushed out of the stack. Now, when the uh, when the control uh, again goes back to process A, it can easily understand that some of its return addresses has been pushed out of the stack by measuring the execution time of its defined function depths. Now we'll use the scenario that we just described to create a covert channel between a sender and the receiver. The receiver makes 16 nested function calls and yields the CPU in the deepest function without executing any return statement. So as a result, at this point of time, the entire RAS is filled with return addresses of the receiver process and the control now goes to the sender process. Now the sender process is a, a bit stream of zeros and one as shown in this uh, adjoining sample program. On processing, uh, uh, the value of the bit 1, it makes a function call and processing a 0, it does nothing. So suppose it processes uh, bit 1, so uh, it, it executes a call to, the, to this function func, so as a result, the return address also of this function gets pushed onto the RAS. Now since the RAS was full with the receiver's return addresses, one of the return address of the receiver will be pushed out of the stack. Now, the access again goes back to the receiver. So after the re uh, receiver after getting the control of the CPU back, it will start executing the unfinished return commands by referencing the addresses stored in the stack. So to input the message transmitted across the covert channel, the receiver measures the timing latency of its outermost function call. So on receiving a 1, the receiver will encounter a stack underflow situation and thereby we will uh, we'll see a increase in the execution time whereas in one receiving a zero no extra latency will be observed. The adjoining figure shows the timing values as observed by the receiver. The threshold is empirically selected and the timing values above the threshold denote a bit 1 and below the threshold denote a bit 0. We have conducted the experiment on multiple system where we reverse engineer the size of the RAS and performed our covert channel experiment to observe the average bandwidth. 
So now to demonstrate Russell on a real world setting, we target the scalar multiplication operation in P384 curve from OpenSSL library. Elliptic of cryptography is one of the most widely used asymmetric key algorithms based on the algebraic properties of elliptic curves over finite field. Scalar multiplication is a fundamental and security critical operation in ECC, which computes Q equals to KP, where K is an n bit secret scalar and Q and P are points on the elliptic curve. The security of ECC is defined by the hardness of determining the scalar K given both the points and the curve parameters. The scalar multiplication in OpenSSL for this curve is implemented using Montgomery ladder with conditional swaps and non adjacent form for scalar representation. The scalar K is trans uh, transformed to its corresponding WNAP representation and based on this representation a series of double and add operations are executed to perform the multiplication. These operations are further implemented by a series of BN add and BN sub functions. We now proceed to perform template attack on ECC scalar multiplication. The victim and the uh, attacker are sharing the same logical code and thereby sharing the same RAS. The, uh, the attacker first fills up the RAS and yields the CPU to the victim. The victim again performs uh, ECC multiplication through the Montgomery ladder operation and yields the CPU after each iteration of the Montgomery ladder. So the access again comes back to the adversary which now measures the timing for its function calls. So more specifically the spy first fills up the RAS, uh, entire RAS with the return address of its n functions. Uh, here the value n can be uh, easily determined by reverse engineering the size of the RAS and then it yields the control of the CPU without executing any return statement. So at this point of time the entire RAS is filled up with the return address of the spy. The control now goes back to the victim which is executing ECC scalar multiplication operation. The victim yields the CPU after every iteration of the ladder. The, the control now comes back to the spy again which measures its own execution time to check whether any of its return addresses have been pushed out of the stack. We perform the attack in an iterative manner. At a particular instance, the adversary targets the ith bit of the secret scalar given the assumption that the adversary already knows the first i-1 bits. The template attack works in two phases, template building and template matching. During the template building phase, the attacker simulates the number of bn add and bn sub function calls for each bit. As the number of bn add and bn sub function calls depend on the particular bit being processed and the affine coordinate of the curve points, the attacker builds templates for each bit based on the total number of these function calls executed for a fixed set of input plain text. For any particular bit, say the ith bit, the attacker performs point multiplication using a set of unique inputs, fixing the ith bit to be both 0 and 1. Next, on each input, the attacker estimates the total number of addition and subtraction function calls made by the ECC program for the ith bit, assuming its value to be both 0 and 1, and simultaneously it uses a spy process to measure the execution time using RASL. Now that we have the overall strategy, let's see the process in detail. We introduce an encoding scheme to represent the total number of bn add and bn sub function calls as unique classes. Suppose for a particular input and ith bit, the Montgomery ladder executes x bn uh, sub and y bn add function calls. We represent this as uh, this class as xy. Now, based on these classes, we segregate the corresponding inputs and associated timing values by creating hypothetical bins corresponding to each class. So by fixing the ith bit to be 0, we get a set of bins and by fixing it the value to be 1, we get another set of bins. In our experiments, we found out that the classes mostly belong in the range 81 to 85, then 90 to 96 and then again 100 to 106. So the attacker selects a pair of bins which contains relatively high number of inputs. In this example, the class 83 and 95. So the takeaway from this is that for each bit position, there will be four template bins. Two for when uh, the value of the bit is 1 and two for when the value of the bit is 0. Now once we have selected our bins, we proceed to the template matching phase. In the template matching phase, the goal of the attacker is to predict the correct value of the ith bit. The attacker again observes the encryption process using inputs associated with the four selected bins and also observes the timing values using RASL. 
the idea is basically the timing values for the correct ith bit should match with either of the two set of templates but not with both so here is the result from our experiments so this is a template for uh, for the 350th bit as value 0 we can see the classes uh, were selected as eight, uh, 83 and 95 now for the correct estimate we can see the distribution quite clearly matches with the template or uh, with the correct template whereas for the wrong estimate it does not match with the template the attack on ecc scalar multiplication demonstrates how rasel can be utilized to leak information about the control flow of another process but the challenge there was that it requires the victim to yield the control of the cpu for every iteration so so this yielding of the control of the cpu can be made possible using deadline schedulers which impose a deadline on operations to prevent starvation of processes the victim and the spy can then be executed with a single escape runtime parameters in this case we assume that one of the schedulers must be a deadline scheduler of the system and the user obviously needs to have capsis nice capability to launch the attack from user space however no synchronization mechanism is required inside the victim code before moving on to our next attack we will provide a brief background on, on ecdsa ecdsa typically uses an elliptic curve with a base point p of prime order q and consists of two parts one is a signing operation where a nonce k is sampled uniformly in the range 1 to q minus 1 and outputs the signature r comma s and the other part is a verify where given a signature r comma s and a message m it computes the hash and finally outputs one if the x coordinate of z modulus q is equals to r or zero otherwise now we perform the attack on ecdsa in two parts one is the online phase where we perform a, a targeted recovery of a fraction of the MSB or most significant bit of the nonces sampled by the ECDSA signing algorithm with the help of RASL. And in the offline phase, we combine the partial nonce information with lattice based cryptanalytic techniques to retrieve the final signing key. For the online part of the attack, we again resort to template attack on randomly selected nonces, but this time we consider building templates of a window of unknown bits instead of a bit by bit iterative approach for template formation the adversary executes a spy and a dummy victim process performing ecc scalar multiplication simultaneously using deadline scheduler so for the l bit of the msb position of the nonces there can be 2 to the power l combinations of bit sequences possible we build templates for bit sequences of each of these 2 to the power l combination now for each of the 2 to the power l bit sequences the dummy victim process performs ecc scalar multiplications using 2 to the power l nonces by changing the l most significant bits while keeping the other bits same whereas the spy running in parallel continuously fills up the ras and probes it to observe the timing values through rasl as the adversary requires to retrieve only l msbs of the nonce the spy considers only those l timing observations that correspond to the l msbs so now the adversary has timing samples for L MSBs of each of the 2 to the power L bit sequences of the nonce. Next, the adversary selects medians from each of these timing distributions as a representative template for a particular bit position of a particular sequence. Now, from the figure, it is apparent that the distribution of timing samples for each bit position can be subdivided into three regions. The most intuitive explanation for, of this observation is that. The spy tries to achieve synchronization with the help of deadline scheduler without explicit handles inside the victim code. So due to the absence of perfect synchronization mechanism, there is a mutual overlap between the timing samples of any two adjacent trace points. So therefore we define three separate regions in the timing distribution, a lower region, a middle region and an upper region and we select medians from each of these regions. Therefore the adversary will have 3 into L into 2 to the power L templates for L MSB positions of the 2 to the power L ca nonce candidates. Now in the template matching phase, we choose 500 non-signature pairs for a randomly chosen ECDSA signing key. The attacker tries to extract the 6 MSBs of each of these 500 nonces. So for a particular bit position, we have 2 to the power 6 templates each having 3 regions. 
Next, we select the median which has the least difference with the actual observed timing value. And finally, we perform a least square error method to determine the top 5 templates that represent the possible combinations for the 6 MSB. So therefore, for 500 nonces, we have 500 cross 5 candidate combinations of the 6 MSB. The table shows the ordering of candidate nonce combinations of the 6 MSBs for, uh, uh, achieved by least square, uh, least square error. Now, given the noisy leakage samples on the partial nonces used by the ECDSA signing algorithm, we aim to recover the ECDSA signing key using a combination of lattice reduction algorithm and statistical mixing and matching of leakage samples. We adopt a trial and error approach where we randomly select 200 non uh, candidate partial nonces to create the hidden number problem instance. We convert them into lattice and the target vector for the CVV problem instance and finally solve the CVV problem instance using the FILL FI solver to arrive at a guess for the secret key. If the guess is correct, the attack outputs the recovered secret key otherwise it repeats the same process for a different randomly selected set of instances. We must note that the attack can trivially identify when the correct key has been recovered by checking if it yields the correct public key which is available for verification. This check involves a single deterministic scalar multiplication. So when the attack terminates by outputting a secret uh, key, we can be sure that the correct secret key has been recovered as opposed to merely guessing the correct secret key. So the, this table shows the time taken for ECDSA key retrieval for partially leaked nonces where we try with 500 signatures and we see that nonces re, uh, retrieve in each of the cases where the online phase took somewhere around 5 seconds to 7 seconds and the offline phase took around one, one uh, or little more than 1 hour. For our attack, we use the following system. For the online phase, we, the, uh, we just use a system with a processor having Intel Xeon CPU E52609 V4. It has a de by default a deadline scheduler in it. And the operating system was Red Hat Linux Server 7.7 .7 with kernel, kernel 3.10. The deadline should, uh, scheduler parameter that we set was uh, the SCAD runtime as 3600, SCAD deadline as 3700, and SCAD period as 7200. For the offline phase, more specifically for the lattice reduction part, we used a cluster having 260 nodes where each node had 128 AMD EPIC 7742 processors with 2.25 GHz nominal and 3.4 GHz peak clock speed and a RAM of 512 GB of 3200 MHz. So to conclude, in this presentation, we discussed about Retinate Stack, a core component of the speculative execution subsystem. We propose a generic methodology to reverse engineer the RAS for undocumented processors. We propose a novel attack RASL where a covert channel could be created between two co-located processes. Using RASL, we demonstrated an exploit on ECC scalar multiplication over the P384 curve. We, as we demonstrated asynchronous execution by utilizing the deadline scheduler. And finally, we showed an exploit on breaking the ECDSA signature generation algorithm over curve to P256. Thank you for your attention.